with a feudal type system. Feudal systems haven't been used in the last 350 years, and they're coming back like gangbusters. If we are complacent, if we do not speak out in droves, and I'm not just talking about me, I'm talking about a bunch of us getting together and getting on the stump and loving our country more than we love our lives, getting on, some of us are going to get killed. I almost got killed a couple of weeks ago. I hadn't been for a uh, hadn't been for an FBI, a retired FBI man, who risked his life, his career, everything, put it all on the line, and he didn't know me from Adam. A week prior to that, uh, he he re he listened to one of my tapes I gave up in Post Falls, Idaho, and I'm gonna be very blunt about. He mentioned he said that we need a lot more of you, but unfortunately we're not getting anybody. Well, I'm trying to, I'm not the best speaker in the world, but I'm trying to relay to you that we need to get out and seriously get the message out. These shows are great. This, this hall should be absolutely packed, standing room only, and we should be getting the message out to as many people as we can with as many shows as there are, is it possibly to reach. There are many is the public. We ought to get on talk shows, we've got to get on we've got to get on news shows and TV shows and we have to really get the message out. And I think we're doing it, but it's it's a little bit slow in the in the first part. That's that's just that part of the what I want to say. In working with the black projects, I was very loyal. I was picked because I was very strong mentally. There's a bunch of us that were picked because we don't crack under pressure. We don't freak under pressure, so to speak. Everyday events don't bother us. Now, I was involved in something very controversial, almost totally unbelievable to most of you. Some of you are religious people. I think all religions, all religions, have a time and a place, and they definitely have a place in America. Now, another thing I want to reach to you is that during the unbelievable part, I was involved in building another base onto in inside of Dulce, New Mexico, which is Los Alamos Laboratory. It's a biological laboratory on the southwest part of the Archuleta Mesa. Uh, we built an underground facility, a better part of three cubic miles hollowed out underground. Then to the southwest of that, we built, we were, we were in the process of the early stages of building. We drilled four large uh, tunnel-like holes. Some of them ran two and a half miles under the surface. Uh, number of the early, at that time, number of the original uh, uh, wells or dr uh, drilling uh, machines that were used were were um, uh, at the rate of up two miles a day. It was fairly rapid. The equipment kept coming up broken. So we wanted to go down. We wanted to send somebody down there, a human observer, or human observers in this case, to find out what was going on. Well, to our total surprise, first of all, the government knew all about it. They didn't tell anybody. Uh, when I saw Green Beret and Black Beret people encamped inside of our geologist camp, I knew something was up, the gig was up. First of all, I knew all about the alien agenda. I'll explain that in a few minutes. The large alien greys had been encamped there for as best as believed possible about four or five hundred years. It had been one of their internal bases. And we'd, we'd drilled holes right on top of it. All the stinking air, all the black sooty air came right out as soon as one of the first hole was sunk and all this soot came up and well that's when it all all the hell broke loose really, all it started. Anyway, after we drilled all four holes, it took about a, two days to drill all four of them. And when you build a underground base, you drill four basic holes and then you build you know, called stopes or cross member holes across and then you bla use blasting equipment, you know, special blasting equipment by the analyzation of the rock formation 
and you literally blast out or tunnel out or, or deflagrate or melt rock out to build the large rooms that are required for this underground base. Well, in this process, I was lowered down the basket of one of these holes, and about from me to this elderly woman here in the front was sitting a seven-foot-tall alien gray. The stench was worse than the worst garbage can you can imagine. Uh, the person was at, or the entity was absolutely horrible. I didn't waste any time to reach for my pistol. At that time, as an engineer, I didn't have time to carry all the folder, all of one of these big submachine guns that all the sea spray and the yellow fruit and the, all the uh, outer perimeter and inner perimeter security people carried. I carried a little Walter PPK pistol with a nine-shot clip. <clears throat> this was in late August of 1979. Now, you got a regular suit of clothes. You got a regular clothes on. Plus, you're in a almost like a spacesuit environment, and you're reaching for a gun. It's it's not the easiest thing to do, and then to pop a clip in it and start shooting. And I killed two of them. Yes, they're mortal, and they do die. However, in the process, uh, one of them did this. I rem all I remember is that he just kind of waved his hand in front of his chest and the next thing I know this blue beam hit me and just literally opened me up like a fish and every uh, burnt, burnt my fingers right off of me and it was some form of electrical force because the kind of like hit, being hit by a lightning bolt burned all my toenails off of me uh, completely crispy crittered my left foot burnt the shoe right off of me um, all I remember is the smoking remains, and I'm laying almost, I'm still conscious, but in and out of, I didn't remember much. And there was a, a Green Beret that was right behind me that risked his life. In fact, he died. But he risked his life. He shoved me back in the bass and hit the button and took me up. And I wouldn't be alive talking to you today if it wasn't for him. I'm forever indebted. He lost his life. 66 Secret Service agents, Green Berets, Black Berets, crack troops lost their lives because the government, our United States government, lied, did not tell us anything about the alien threat. There's a war underneath there, and I'm d talking dead serious. It's been going on since that time. Since late August of 1979, our military, the Russian military, basically the militaries of the world have been in constant conflict with the outer space alien. The, the small gray, the large gray, the reptilians, the whole thing. There are, 11, there are 11 distinct races of aliens. Two are benevolent. One had to leave here in a hurry because their world is under attack, both on the surface as well as underground there, the Pleiadesians. They're familiar, maybe some of you are familiar with that, uh, would some of you raise your hands who've heard of Billy Meyer and uh, some of the, uh, oh, very good, about half the group. Well, Billy Meyer is one of these lucky people that they figured, well, he's kind of a simple type, we'll show him everything. Well, these are the benevolent aliens and they've been here helping us. In fact, I have a picture, I have a picture, let me reach for it here. I have a picture of one of the aliens been working for the United States Pentagon for the last 58 years. His name is Val, Val Valiant Thor. He's right here. There's my father in the background. This old place, the ready room of the USS Eldridge, Al Bielica has probably explained or maybe even shown you this picture. There's a list of the, some of the notable people in it. They're all the atomic bomb scientists of the day, all the uh, time variant uh, experimentalists of the day, all the top physicists of, of that particular day. This was, in, this was in August of 1943. Now this guy has not changed one iota in 58 years. Started work, he came here, crashed here or whatever, whether he's under duress or not, he started work for our U.S. Navy and military operations in 1937, uh, either 37 or 38 is what I've been told. So it's 
For 58 years, this man's been employed, probably under duress. If you don't do as we say, we're just going to use you for alien bait or something. I don't know. But anyway, he basically hasn't changed. He lives for 490 years, what he says his lifespan is. Now, he is supposedly a semi-benevolent, he's a human-looking type person. He has six fingers and six toes, and he's got one oversized heart, one lung, giant lung. Uh, his blood vessels are bigger. He's got copper oxide for blood similar to an octopus. Uh, his brain capacity 300 centimeters greater than ours. He has a thinking capacity, uh, IQ, if, it, if you were to measure it, be totally off the scale, be about a 1200 IQ. Um, he speaks 100 languages fluently, alien as well as others. Um, he's a remarkable person. I had a chance to meet him one time. Now, um, by the way, he doesn't shake hands. He was kind of in a spacesuit because all aliens, regardless benevolent or otherwise, they're carrying germs and diseases and bacterium in and on them that are deadly to us. If, if I were making policy, I, I'd quarantine them all because, because how do we not know that some of our diseases like AIDS, Ebola, uh, hantavirus, and a few of these other weird designer diseases, as I call them, are not made from the cadavers of some of these aliens as a biological weapon to use against the people of the United States. Well, I'm tired. I'm a tired American speaking out. Now, what I'm telling you is kind of a, almost like a brain overload here. Back in 1946, we set off a number, actually four atomic bomb tests at Bikini Atoll. It's a group of islands in the South Pacific. I have an original photograph here with original language on the photograph that shows there is a large alien spaceship off a wingtip of the United States aircraft it was a drone aircraft right at the point where the bomb was beginning to show a neutron flash cloud. Here's the bomb going off. Here's the airplane tip here, and here is the alien spacecraft. Now, in 1947, excuse me, 1947, questions later, please. In 1947, after Roswell debacle, our military got before the U.S. Senate. They were hauled before the U.S. Senate and says, what's going on here? Well, we didn't know anything about disks until this happened. It flopped in our backyard. Total lie. They lied to the U.S. Senate. They should have been prosecuted as traitors. Anybody lying to a United States Senator or House of Representative, any Senator or House of Representative person, President of the United States, Vice President, any, any Cabinet member, lying to the American public is a traitor and should be dealt with in an appropriate fashion. This is actual proof, positive, that this occurred in 1946. Now, the U.S. military knew all about flying disks and flying disk technology as early early as 1933. Of course, we remember the Germans did too, the Nazi Germans, Hitler and all, all their bunch of people. Now, it gets to the big question, if, if all this has been hidden from us, you know, everybody says, well, where's the proof? I've got some of the proof laying on the table, but a lot of you probably are totally skeptical. They say, well, I could be anything. hand here, I have a piece of what's called corbamite. It's the heaviest element in the world. Element 140. This piece of material weighs 15 ounces. It's three and a half times the weight of uranium. It cannot be made to emit 
gamma rays.